Thank you, Adam, and it's so nice to hear, uh, Kristen, your presentation and also Inigo. Um, I was told I didn't have to promote Williams, that this could just be about art, and, uh, uh, but I had actually begun a lecture not long ago with Williams, so I thought that would be a good place to start. And it wasn't to promote Williams, but to think about the fact that I went to Williams, I wanted to be an artist, and I figured, Rather than go to art school, I needed content. So I would go to a liberal arts college where you could learn a lot of things. And uh, I was very fortunate to be there, not only when Inigo was working in the studio so we could hang out together and have a beer at the log and talk about art or painting or whatever, but also when the Williams College Museum of Art was being expanded and rebuilt. And here's a photograph you know of Lawrence Hall. And I got a chance while I was a student to really work there all the time, maybe too much, my grade suffered. But I learned a lot about thinking about art with real objects. And you know, Williams, the, the, the hall there, Lawrence Hall, like this library. This was actually a library with its ionic columns represents stability and timelessness. And that's what the museum or a bank is supposed to communicate or an educational institution <laughs> or a library. And the thing is, I, I got a chance to do things like this, and you see in the background 800 BC Assyrian reliefs juxtaposed in this hall with a work by Robert Morris from the 1970s. And because Williams was small and the collection was from all over the place, we were playful. And that whole idea of being playful, I'm not sure I remember a lot about the facts of what I learned, but I did come away with some very interesting other points of view. And a lot of it was about, in the studio, about if you're gonna make something or think about something, you need to think differently. Turn it upside down, backwards, inside out. Be a contrarian. And so that lesson, I think, has taken me um, to this other space. I remember coming out of Lawrence Hall and down from the art studios. In the old days, we didn't have the fancy art building. We were actually in the old laundry laundromat, at, and, uh, which was not a good building, but we got to go through these, uh, the back of, of the art building. And Charles Moore, the famous postmodern architect, uh, had done the design for the new building, and at the back were these ironic columns. <laughs> Why were they ironic? Because, of course, columns don't hold anything up today with steel buildings. You don't need columns, those ideas of stone columns. The ones in Lawrence Hall were practically fake, too. But this idea that he left this space, this irony, got me thinking. Isn't everything always changing as technology changes, as culture changes? Those statistics will change if we can think in a contrarian way. And so I followed that idea as I was uh, not wanting to be in the museum world, because I really wanted to be an artist, but at some point I had to admit that Inigo was way better than me. But I can make another contribution working with art and with artists. And, and truly, in those days when I was in the studio, I hated these big institutions, dusty institutions that were all about stability. I wanted to take a baseball bat, like Kristen described, and tear those institutions down. So now I find myself building one, but hopefully from that little bit of a contrarian point of view. And now in Los Angeles, which has a nice, it's a nice place to have a different point of view. So, I started thinking about when I took over the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, which is one of the largest art museums in the United States, you know, these libraries, museums, maybe educational institutions, they haven't really been rethought in a couple hundred years, in essence. You know, since before the common travel of an airplane or, or uh, the photograph, for example, that brings things uh, around the world, or even the telephone, forget the internet. And so I thought, wow, those premises, maybe we should update them a little bit. Maybe there are new ways to think about them. And LA is a great place because here in older cities in Europe, everything's so stable. This is the Met in 1872. And less than 50 years later, it looked like this. You know it, how powerful with its Greco-Roman temple facade. It just exudes stability and power of a narrative where you can walk in and see Greece and Rome and Egypt and walk up those stairs to 18th century Europe and be sure you understand the origins and future of culture. Several years after that, LA still looked like this, where the museum was in 1922. And it wasn't actually until eight years after that that LA looked like this, but boy, did it grow fast. So I thought this laboratory, this Petri dish, where everything is happening so fast, it's a new city, is a great place to rethink things. 
And in fact, it wasn't until 1965, 50 years ago, that LACMA, this museum, Los Angeles County Museum of Art, proudly was made in the image of Lincoln Center. A couple of years later, Ed Ruscha, a famous LA artist, painted it on fire, already to, ready to tear down that institutional framework. But this new museum was built in 65, very proud. But we're now in the 20th century, and because the museum was built so late, and I say out of cardboard rather than stone, you know, one of the problems at the Met is those walls are so thick they can't get Wi-Fi through them. If you have a cheap built museum recently built, then it's really easy to take a baseball bat to it. And I'm gonna talk about doing that in a minute. But the question was, what could a museum be in a different place in a different time? Why did you have to take the givens of what things were, or how you, you learned they should be? So I've started about 10 years ago to transform the place. I was hired to run a transformation campaign. And the transformation campaign started in a traditional way. How do you transform? Well, you build buildings. So we built a bunch of buildings. Renzo Piano, we built over 100,000 square feet of galleries, new gardens. We annexed a whole city block of space. We doubled the campus, the attendance, the exhibitions. Those are all traditional measures. We bought 25,000 works of art. Now, all those things were needed because LA was playing a little catch up. But that really wasn't my interest. I had worked on projects like that before. My interest was, how do you just rethink things a little bit? So here's a painting by John Baldessari, a friend who's an LA artist, rethinking painting. You know, start from scratch, flip it upside down, be a contrarian. Here's a painting in our collection by John Baldessari called Wrong, which I always felt was a great inspiration for what I was trying to do because of the awkwardness of it. Why is it wrong? Well, you don't really make a composition with a palm tree behind a person that looks like it's growing out of his head, so it's definitely wrong as a composition. But is it wrong or is it right? Because if it makes you think differently, it might just be right. One of the things I love to do is work with artists. And so um, I've always worked with artists. And, and I, I remember when I got to LACMA, I wanted to redo the logo. And I have hired five designers. And nobody came up with anything I loved. So I called my friend John Baldessari and said, can you help me with this? You're pretty good with text. Maybe you can do something like wrong. That's kind of fun. And he came back with this image just underlining the L and the A. That's all it took to take LACMA and make it LA. And the out of sky and that pencil with the palm tree and you know, like an artist drawing or measuring things, this idea of measuring things up. Um, but of course he said, does anybody know what that means anymore? So when he did it for the banners, of course he placed an iPhone there as a kind of drawing tool, which is today's drawing tool, thinking about updating things. I didn't want to just show artists work. Like a museum wants to take an artist, take the piece, get rid of the artist, put the piece in the museum, in that box so everyone can see it. I wanted to have artists work on the frame to sort of reshape, help me reshape the frame of reference, knock things down, rebuild them. So I called John when we were doing an exhibition of Magritte and Contemporary Art. Could he help me with this? And what he did was he, he made a ceiling of LA freeways, wallpaper of LA freeways, and he made the entire ground of the exhibition a carpet of blue sky and, and, and clouds, turning the world upside down, which was such a nice gift. And I thought about that process in the studio we used to go through in studio, not, or not in art history, to turn things upside down, backwards, inside out. You had to do that if you were gonna come up with something. You know, everything is relative, upside down. You could look at the world this way. We all know North is just a cultural construction. We constantly take things for granted that we don't need to take for granted. So I thought inside out, backwards, upside down, I could use these things. So if I wanted, I could start this museum with contemporary art. Here's a work by Barbara Kruger, which becomes sort of the entrance to the museum. You don't have to start with ancient Greece and Rome. And maybe you walk through that museum backwards through time, and maybe it's a, it's a different even look at time. I knew from my Williams days, I had read T.S. Eliot, and I love this phrase that the past should be altered by the present as much as the present is directed by the past. Every new thing we say, if you set a new measure for women writing or for how that gunshot looks, it does color our entire sense of history and memory. Every new thing changes everything in the past, and there are always ways to think about that difference of time. 
So instead of even going backwards through time to Greece and Rome, I thought, well, maybe I could go back to pre-Columbian or ancient American art history. And this is an installation at LACMA where another artist, Jorge Pardo, who lives in Mexico, is Cuban-born, redid the installation in a quite unusual way to make people rethink the frame. It isn't just a gray box. Of course, those works weren't even made for museums. They were made for graves or the netherworld. So there's a responsibility to rethink how you present them. Or if you have a library like this, you always get the globe in the library to show that you know the whole world. So we collected, a, there's a, I have a whole room that we're gonna to put together of a photographer, by the artist by the name of Andreas Gursky, where he does nothing but photographs the oceans. In this case, these are NASA photographs, the place where there is no culture, world inside out. Maybe you meditate and look at the emptiness of the ocean as a way to refresh the mental palette about what you're seeing and rethink things. Or inside out, why can't the outside be the museum just as much as the inside? And in this case, commissioning an artist, Robert Irwin, to make the Garden of Palm trees, which is really nice for LA. Uh, in fact, he did this the year the mayor said, oh, we shouldn't have any more palm trees, we should have oaks because they're more environmentally friendly. And I thought, great, that means the palm trees are artworks. They're cultural specimens, not nature, as they are. Um, you know, this is in Oxford, the Ashmolean Museum, this ideal that we're still working from, of that Greco-Roman temple facade. But that idea of being playful that I learned at Williams was very useful. So our temple facade is by Chris Burden, an LA artist. It's not made of the past. It's made of LA street lamps. And it's not made of high culture. It's made of the street. And between the palm trees and the 202 street lamps, cast iron street lamps from LA, we have our fake temple facade that's actually kind of real because it's from LA and it's lit up all night and it's art, not architecture, which is another nice reversal. I love monumental sculpture. It doesn't mean that you can't think about the ancient past and about how human beings have always been interested in art and architecture. I remembered this when I, uh, uh, Michael Heiser, an artist, called me uh, about a, a stone he had found. I was thinking about monuments I know very well, Cleopatra's Needle in New York, and it always represented to me that idea that you have to have Egypt if you want to be a real culture, you have to go back to the origins. And when he called me, there's a picture on the left there of uh, moving Cleopatra's Needle. It's a great fanfare. Michael Heiser had found this rock in California and weighed about 350 tons. He said he couldn't move it to his studio a mile high, but he could bring it to LACMA, did I want it? <laughs> I remembered Cleopatra's needle, moving the needle through the space, through the New York to great fanfare, and said, why steal a obelisk from Egypt when you can have a rock from California? So we moved that rock to on no, over nine nights to tens of thousands of people, as probably was in New York or in ancient times, and moved it to LACMA uh, to a permanent installation, which is itself a reversal. It's called levitated mass because that's 350 tons. You can walk right under it and look at it from the bottom. You never get to see the bottom of big, heavy sculpture. Um, and when the board asked me, you know, you just gave us a lecture about how the future is media because I had done that in a board meeting. Why are you moving 350 ton rocks and putting up 202 street lamps? And of course I said, well, you have to take your Instagram picture from somewhere. <laughs> that the idea of place and identity never goes out of style and media is a way to express that. And there's this interrelationship between place and media and that's what the museum could do if it had its eyes both looking back and looking forward. In fact, um, when I got into the 2008 economic crisis and, and I had to cut some programs, I was very frustrated that in LA, the only program that wasn't funded was the film program. So another contrarian gesture, I cut the film program. And all of a sudden, I got everyone's attention for a change. Very uh, interesting way to raise money. But after Marty's letter to me, I met with him in New York, he did a talk, we sort of talked about how we really needed to rethink film, that it was a moment to do that in LA. And that led to what will open in two years, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts uh, is building the world's largest movie museum. So LA will have art and film as it should, and media is important. And in fact, when people ask about the future, it's probably surprising. It will combine many things of the past and the present. The next show we'll do is I'm an artist from California, from LA, Diana Thayer who this is actually moving video projection into space, combining real space and media. Who knows what the future looks like, but it's very exciting. And finally, I took that baseball bat to the museum and I thought, 
if we're going to build a museum for the 21st century, maybe we could start from scratch in LA because our buildings were really terrible. So I proposed to the board that we would tear it down 400,000 square feet of space and rebuild it and ask the basic questions. Questions like these, what if the museum was transparent and you could look inside? More than half the people who come to our museum don't even know what's inside. Why would you go inside if you didn't know what was inside? Any retail store knows you have to have a glass window. So just simple things like that seem to be, what if it wasn't one narrative or one timeline, but there were many stories? We hired Peter Zumtor, who's a Swiss architect who works very much like a, um, an artist, I think, to sort of rethink the poetic dimension that bends time and space, that you don't have to be so traditional. And we've in, uh, come up with a design that will now be presented to the public, which is quite extraordinary. It's a big building, but it has, we never actually in the whole eight year design process ever talked about what it would look like. Didn't matter. We just wanted it to follow a certain set of values and out of that would come form, like it would be non-hierarchical so that not one culture is in the front and another in the back. So therefore it had to be curved, it had to be on one level. It would be efficient, it would be accessible, it would be transparent, it would be sustainable, but hopefully it would still be sublime. And the image for that building is to literally bridge over Wilshire Boulevard. It's such a big horizontal thing. It should be transparent so you can walk through the park. Every culture is on one floor. And it's, and it's inside and outside, and it's just one way of thinking about how even architecture and art can interrelate to allow us to think differently about the past and the future. Thank you.